Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. Thanks for all the people who have been watching our videos here and the new subscribers and the old subscribers. Tell as many Beatle fans as you can about this channel because we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. Um, if you're a fan of one of my podcast shows, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, once in a while we do a show which is called Rack Our Brains. In fact, we just celebrated our 100th episode of Talk More Talk, and it happened to be a Rack Our Brains show. Rack Our Brains is an idea whereby, well, in the show we're about to do, me, the host, will ask questions to my guests, and they have no idea what the questions are going to be. It's not trivia. It's all opinion related questions that have something to do with the Beatles. And most likely it's probably something they haven't even thought about themselves. But I like to spring it on my guests and see what kind of answers they come up with. And when we did our show on Talk More Talk, it was kind of the reverse of that because we invited our listeners to be on screen with us and ask the co-hosts the questions. And that was a lot of fun. But this time the tables have turned and the victims will be my guests on the show at this time. And so we're going to bring back some of our regulars here. First of all, Al Sussman, who you know for his many years writing articles for Beatle Fan Magazine, a contributing editor for Beatle Fan. He also wrote the book Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped the Generation. For several years, he was my co-host on the Beatles talk show, Things We Said Today. And you always see him at the Fest for Beatle fans. He's on loads of panels there for many years. He helped to organize the panels. And uh, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, Al. Hi, Ken. Nice to, nice to be here. And speaking of things we said today, one of my co-hosts, you know, the, the newer co-hosts of things we said today, he's actually been on now for what, four years, five years? Something like that. Yeah, I think it's close to five. So okay. what year? 2017, didn't we? Uh, Sounds about right. the... Yeah, it was shortly after after I and left and left. after right. Steve That's... left. Right. Yeah, five years. Yeah. And he's a great co-host. It's always great to have conversations with him. He's been on New York's WFUV for nearly 40 years, where he's done fantastic programs there. A lot of great interviews, some Beatles specials including a Beatles Christmas special not that long ago. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, Ken. How are you, Al? And a big hello to John as well, who we haven't been introduced to yet, so. Okay. John Montagna has been a guest on this channel. He's also been a guest on Things We Said Today and Talk More Talk. And he spent, what was it, seven years with the Alan Parsons Project, right? Was it the seven? Alan, seven years with the Alan Parsons Live Project, yes. Right, touring with Alan Parsons and his band. Correct. And he was also in the house band for Happy Together. You probably have seen him at the Fest for Beatle fans because he does bass mm -hmm. clinics there. And you've actually got to see him play the bass to a lot of Beatles music not that long ago for the Abbey Road album. And he's playing along with the backing tracks and nailing Paul's parts. And uh, yes, you have, John. Don't be oh. modest. And uh, he also has, I wasn't aware of this, a Beatles one-on-one -on -one online course for the Gowanus Music Club. Oh, Welcome, right. Josh. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> we, st we started Beatles 101 during the height of the pandemic. It was myself, mm. um, Josh Margolis, who's the director of Gowanus Music Club here in Brooklyn, uh, Cameron Greider, who's a phenomenal guitarist, and uh, Jack Petrozelli from the Fab Faux. Oh, wow. You know. So the yeah. four of us got together and um, a couple of Zoom meetings about how this was going to take shape. And we decided that it was only really going to be viable if we used the Beatles music as launch pads for people to cultivate their own musicianship rather than just showing you, okay, here's how you play the solo. Mm -hmm. to she's a woman or whatever it's like let's break down the solo to she's a woman and see where it comes from how how what he's doing re relates to the harmony um we would take uh we would, we, would, we would take one of the songs apart and 
pick apart the influences where they came from and you'd be surprised actually you wouldn't but but like all these songs are made up you know the the dna of all these songs go so deep yeah. and you can take like just i saw her standing there alone hmm. is built on chuck berry uh this uh, the uh, travis picking in the in george's part uh i mean it's all kinds of threads uh, that it would take us down. I got into real deep dives into the history. We had some guest speakers. Jerry Hammock was on with us. Chris Carter uh -huh. uh, from Breakfast with the Beatles. It was really, really fun. We had a lot of fun uh, with some uh, with some really talented folks. And we did like collaborative uh, recording projects together. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Wow, that's certainly that's something I'd like to watch. Yeah. <laughs> deep dive like that mm -hmm. you really understand the nitty-gritty of where, how the Beatles got their songs yeah you can never learn enough <laughs> um, so what I have planned for the show for Iraq our brains I have four questions here and like I said our guests don't know what these questions are and it'll be interesting to find out what they come up with here and um, we're gonna start with Al uh oh <laughs> <laughs> throw me into the pit of doom <laughs> don't worry each of you will get it uh, will get a turn being the first one um al sussman if you could go back in time and attend any concert concert performance the beatles gave which one would you choose now for this you can even go back to the quarrymen if you want to or you can pick shows where Stu Sutcliffe was with them, or Pete Best was with them. So if you had your way, if you could pick one concert from the Beatles that you could have been there for to watch, which one would it be? Uh, actually, I have to admit something. This came up, uh, this same question came up when we did the Rack Our Brains um, um, uh, discussion at the Chicago Fest in August. Okay. So can I give the same answer sure i mean i watched okay. them. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that i didn't remember that but yeah. it's still a great question anyway to throw at anybody so sure yeah what absolutely would your i think it would be the beatles last performance at the cavern which is uh, august 3rd 1963 mm -hmm. uh you know at that point they've had uh three number one singles uh no two two number one singles, three singles total. The fourth single, the one that blasted them into superstardom is just about to be released. And, um, and they, at, at this point they're playing, they're playing theaters in England, but Brian Epstein was, you know, was principled enough that he uh, didn't back out of, uh, of having them play a few shows at the Cavern. And that was the last one. And um, uh, even though it's, it's strange, it's uh, uh, seeing the comments from, from the group about that show, it's kind of similar to the, uh, the Star Club show that was, that was recorded in that they were basically, you know, looking well beyond this. This was like, kind of like, it, just sort of in the history for them, you know, they're like in the rear view mirror. It's kind of like when they were on tour in, in the U S in September of 64 and they're still doing, I want to hold your hand and she loves you, which they never performed again after those, after that tour. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the kind of the same thing, but just to see them at that point in their career, you know, they're basically just on the eve of superstardom right. in in the place where, where they, you know, where basically they became that and the star club, obviously, uh, where they became the band that they became. Right. So I would say August 3rd, 1963. It must've been sad for the fans knowing that that would be the last time there. Uh, it's sad, but also a little bit, a little, there was some anger as well because some of the Liverpudlian fans um, uh, felt that, you know, because the 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 NEMS operation had already moved down to London, and so 
a lot of the the, the Liverpool fans felt that uh, that they were being deserted. Mm. So well, they that makes good. They they knew fans knew the Beatles knew this was the last going to be our last time here. At, at least at the cavern, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. You know, because by that time, yeah, uh, they were becoming so big, and they were just about to become, you know, even bigger. Yeah, right. So it was kind of like the end of a particular of a particular chapter in their right. development. Has anyone ever really examined the sort of social ramifications of that because I get I get the sense that there was like in England there was obviously a, like the social classes at that time mm. were still pretty fixed Ooh. right there oh, was yeah. a hierarchy and that was that's one of the things that was so revolutionary about them was the fact that they sort of broke down a lot of those barriers absolutely between the haves and the have-nots and they they kind of touch on this in the anthology a little bit mm -hmm. um and and lennon in particular in some later interviews was was said you know you know our liverpool fans got pissed off and we made it being a newcastle then the newcastle fans got pissed off we made a lot and has anyone ever really examined the thing of like they were a liverpool group and then they said all right off we go to london to be to and and the and the backlash that happened and and the and the the feeling of like oh they've because there's what's in the the uh, in the anthology the um, they have a, a a girl from the cavern, you mm -hmm. know, like the like the you know please please me is number one in the charts and everybody was crying, you know, they'll go away and they'll belong to us no more or something like yeah. that. She said, yeah. right? Has anyone ever really done like an exam like a, an examination of like the social ramifications think, of that? I think David Bedford. Uh, did some of that in his first book, uh, Liddy Pool. Okay. You know, um, you know, probably not too, uh, you know, too complex, okay. but, um, you know, he definitely touched on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also there was the, you know, the prejudice down in London, you know, like, so what's from Liverpool? Right. You know, right. That sort of thing. And you know, fight their way through that. That's yeah, when, when people from Liverpool, London people would say, you know, call them Northerners. You know, yeah, but... yeah, yeah. For years, I never got that line in Hard Day's Night when the when the cop, you know, reprimands Ringo and he shouts, yes. that Southerner." Like, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, what? I didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And I I know that um, George Harrison wrote in "I Me Mine" when he when he wrote the song "The Light That Has Lighted the World." Mm. was writing it with Scylla Black in mind because mm. he remembered that Scylla Black went through this thing where once she hit it big, that people in Liverpool were kind of like, you know, what happened to you? You're not the same anymore and all yeah, that. Yeah, it, so, it was the same thing, yeah. And it's funny because all these years I've loved that song from George and I equate that with him, <laughs> you know, mm. how he moved on since the Beatles and how people are looking at him, that he's changed. But when he first started writing that song, it was with Scylla in mind. So that's interesting. He was thinking about mm -hmm. it. John, how about you? Okay. I don't know if you saw me kind of like looking around the room <laughs> when that question was answered um, because I didn't want to get up and walk away while Al was talking. So I'm going to have to settle for giving like the vague information that I remember as opposed to the detailed uh, information that I would like to give. But are you familiar with the Dizo Hoffman book? A while ago. It's yeah. Ago. Of, of, <laughs> yeah. So it was like his photo. He was a, a Swiss photographer who basically traveled around with them for the better part of like three years or something. I would say 62 to I think there was five. Yeah, there were there were some shots in his book. He put out a, a great book of photos that was of that was that are annotated and captions. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some there are some photos from like the set of Help, right? And by yeah. then the hair is really long and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So he followed them around on tour, 
and they played a show this is probably 62 63 uh english beatlemania has just started to kind of bubble up and the shows were now becoming these happenings where it was like screaming girls and pandemonium all the time mm -hmm. but apparently they played a show at a boys private school yeah. and there are some shots from the gig and afterward when they were like posing you know with the headmaster and his wife and some of the staff or whatever mm. and it was like it looks like it's like a school auditorium that holds like 200 people right and it's not a huge stage um and everyone's it, it's it's a boys school so it's all boys so they're all sitting down quietly mm. and Dizo's caption is something along the lines of like they could finally like hear themselves after months of going out there and it just being like ah, the whole mm. time now it was like ooh they're they the audience is like keep keeping their mouth shut we can actually play and we can hear them hear each other and i i seem to remember him saying something along the lines of like they were really enjoying being able to hear themselves mm -hmm. and i think they were able to sort of connect a little bit more with the music so it's the easy answer to say the you know uh, candlestick park or this or that mm -hmm. but i would have loved to have seen them like as beatlemania was just beginning to peak and there are some couple of hit records on the charts but now mm -hmm. they're in an, in, in an environment where they can actually hear each other and cut loose and really play as opposed to like fighting the the equivalent of like a jet engine noise mm -hmm. at them you know what i mean and and the photos look like they can actually i mean it, it doesn't look like panda it looks like a regular show it's like all mm -hmm. boys sitting down and them on stage and i thought like that would really be a cool show to see yeah because you figure by that point i mean if you, you know you look at these you know complete beatles chronicles book and you look at their itinerary yeah. mm -hmm. it's merciless no days off and as any musician will tell you, when you're in a band playing night after night after night after night after night, you get red hot. It just it's it's inevitable. You're going to get super tight. So I think by that time, I, th I think that would have been a really cool gig to see. And '63, mm. they didn't have any time off, especially. I, yeah, I think oh. I, I I didn't want to like run and grab the book to consult it while you were talking, but I think it's like I'm guessing it's like '62 or '63. It's pre uh, Ed Sullivan. Uh, he, America. Yeah, we'll have to get the Beatles Chronicle out. Yeah, the I got the Beatles Chronicle out, but I didn't. I couldn't find what it was. If I had the Dizo Hoffman book in front of me, I would find it. But I don't want to go racing. Feel free to go it. while I'm talking. You can go run and get it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'll stay here. All I'm right, Darren. That, Darren. Um, <laughs> it's pretty easy for now. It's I, I have it in my head down to two, two shows that I would want to experience. Uh, the, the one I think that I that would finish second for me would be uh, the first appearance at Shea Stadium, obviously, mm. as a Mets fan, as a New Yorker, and that being, if not the first, one of the first shows of that magnitude to take place in 1965, uh, when they played the first time. Mm -hmm. Um just to say that I was at, you know, as a as a Mets fan at Shea Stadium for this concert. But I probably would not have heard much of anything. So being the type of person that tends to find interesting settings that events take, it, take place in, fascinating and wanting to explore how they logistically did this in this space uh i wish you know the, the side of the original woodstock the um uh wanting to, wanting to go there and actually see how do they did how did you do this when i got there i thought this field was not big enough uh mm -hmm. to do this and what i see in the movie that happened here mm -hmm. or or like um you know I, I, 
we often talk, my, me and my family, about going to vacations. I'm not a big, big vacation guy. I don't need to go see lots of different countries, but I've got this urge to go to Pompeii simply to go in the Colosseum that Pink Floyd played in. <laughs> um, and then I'm fine. Then I'll go back to the hotel to the bar. <laughs> you know, you guys could walk all around Italy. That's a, uh, So my pick would be the, the rooftop performance because it is a mission of mine. I've been in Abbey Road. I've been in Studio 2. I've gone up the stairs into the control room. I've been in Studio 3. Uh, I've been... How did I've you get started, in there? Uh, well, it was late. They Ooh. clocked up, and I saw that a window was left ajar. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I... Uh-oh. I think Darren's freezing up. Uh-oh. He gets all choked up talking about this. I was going to say, yeah. Well, hopefully he's he'll a, come back. He's about to, he's about to spill some good tea at that, at that moment. And then... <laughs> okay, well, Darren, maybe. if you can hear us, maybe you should just... Um... Reboot. Yes, please do. We need you back here. For... <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks this is hysterical? <laughs> one guy's like frozen in place it's happened it's happened kevin pollack used to do that on the kevin pollack chat show in the beginning of the show he'd be talking well thank you for another <laughs> your computer is not buffering anyway then it... oh there he goes all right come on back <laughs> now but that's you, interesting that he picked yeah. the apple rooftop i mean certainly mm. now with the get back documentary you can almost mm. feel like you were there I would have chosen I, for years. I thought I would have loved to have been at that show, mm. th that show that, you know, but That's having having experienced everything that led up to it, mm. it was for some reason when when we watched the third episode and there was the rooftop, I was so tense. Yeah, because of everything that like led up to it and how like unsure of themselves they were that like the fact that they had set up all the gear and even like that morning they, the, the the guys were still like not sure if they were going to go through with it so by the time they walk out mm -hmm. it's like oh geez here we go and like with the cameras and it was for some reason it was just it made me very nervous and of course once they kicked in started plowing into the song it kicked ass and i actually the last uh bass clinic i demonstrated one after 909 as an example nice. of, of paul powering a rhythm section mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in that bass line mm -hmm. that like is a master class mm -hmm. in what what a bass player is supposed to do in terms of in terms of holding it down but also like mccartney can't help but be himself and like throw in a few little little sassy things here and there and he's singing mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same and he's, time. And he's wearing, like, nothing but a black suit in 30-degree <laughs> weather. <laughs> no, but you really, yeah. when you watch that, when you watch the performance and you see different angles and all and certain footage that you didn't see before, yeah, you really can feel that they're enjoying themselves doing this. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. best of all was the footage when they're back in the basement right hmm. after it yeah and they're all relieved and they're they're so happy it's like <laughs> yeah makes you wish they'd like done some more of that like if they would looked at that it's like okay we got over that hump now let's you know like it was just it could have been like a warm but imagine being in a band so big that hmm. like everything they do is under i think that was the it seemed to me that like the tension came from like all the extra scrutiny that every move was going to be, you know, I think that at, at some point they're talking, it's like, look, if we go out there and we do the show and it's like average, mm -hmm. we're done. Right. Mm -hmm. We're done. Right. It has to be mind blowing. Otherwise. Right. And the pressure of that, you know, and they must have felt that the further and further they were away from performing, the greater the expectations would be. Exactly. Right. They, yeah. weren't, they weren't really functioning like a, like a, club band anymore and mm -hmm. wish yeah. they could especially and go back to their roots and play small clubs well you saw what happened yeah. with wings you know first chance he got he's like all right i got a full rhythm section mm -hmm. let's get a bus and off we go yeah 
All right. Well, if we can get Darren back, we'll have him finish his thoughts about the Apple rooftop concert. Mm -hmm. But I guess we should move on to the next question. Now, if you don't like this question, this came from my wife. Oh. So blame her. If you do like this question, you can give me the credit for it. All right. If you could pick a musician while the Beatles were together, but you would want in the band as a fifth Beatle. So there'd be the Fab Five. Who would you want from that time? Is there anyone from the 60s that you could see would have worked really well in the Beatles as a fifth member? I'm not talking about George Martin as a fifth Beatle or uh, Brian Epstein as a fifth Beatle. I'm talking about an actual musician. You could say Billy Preston, since a lot of people, since they love his contributions towards the end mm -hmm. during the get back sessions and all. But if you could pick someone from that time that you think might have worked really well in the Beatles as a fifth member, who would it be? And since I asked Al first on the last question, and Darren's not here, got to single you out, John. <laughs> okay. Um, God, a bunch of names are popping into my head. Um, what era are we talking about? Are we talking about still touring? Are we talking about studio? We're talking about everything, really. I mean, I, I'm not going to say you have to go back to the very beginning of, of their recording career in 62 at EMI. Anytime really in that time frame, a musician that you know existed that was active, whether it was 62, mid-60s, someone that maybe the Beatles were friends with, Okay. Likely so let's, I would think. Right. Well that okay, so that's kind of where I was going. So I'm thinking 64, 65, they've now conquered America, they're back in England and they're the, the kings of everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And everything everything that they touch is gold. I feel fine. She's a woman. Help. Mm -hmm. MBEs. Rubber soul. Right? They're in that sort of era and let's write some fan fiction like you know hey well, I think we could use maybe a fifth member to fill out the sound what instrument would it be it's not going to be another guitar mm. it's going to clutter up the sound maybe a keyboard player right mm -hmm. and two names came to mind Georgie Fame right okay. who's thinking of just thinking of what their sensibilities are as a as a band separate from their sensibilities as songwriters and recording artists when they get together to play they're still like an r b rock and roll band so I'm, I'm thinking of somebody like georgie fame to sort of do some like tasty like you know imagine him like on drive my car mm -hmm. or on or on she's a woman you know doing some you know some stuff um maybe once we start getting into rubber soul revolver and they want a full-time keyboard player. I'm wondering what Rod Argent from the huh. Zombies would do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because by that by that time, so many of the songs had like piano parts, or there's a Wurlitzer break, or something like that. Um, so I'm I'm leaning toward keyboard players, and they would have to be like super duper tasty. And those two guys are the ones that, that kind of pop into mind was there who's the was there a keyboard player in the animals yeah alan price like, alan price thank you yeah i'm thinking of like who was around who would have been like in their orbit mm. also because thinking of how those guys think they're not going to put an ad in the trade papers looking for some unknown they're going to look for a guy who they kind of already know mm -hmm. right billy preston was not some stranger like they knew who this guy was mm -hmm. they stick to they stick to their you know the, they, they they like familiar faces around them and apparently from what i understand both ringo and paul in their respective ecosystems like to have you know familiar faces around them right so it would have to be somebody that that it would be a casual kind of like you know what are you doing tomorrow why don't you come by the studio and kind of put some keyboards on this or whatever and i could see them approaching georgie fame 
and doing that. And then like, yeah, so, you know, Georgia, we got to figure out a way how we're going to get that Hammond on the plane because you're, you're, you're going to be on our next tour. And it would be as, as casual as that. So I could, I could see them having maybe one of those two guys on, on keys. So you're a, thinking more as an extra rather than a permanent member. Oh, well, if we're talking about like, well, because you've got the songwriting team of Lennon and McCartney. Right. Harrison starting to kind of make, you know, get in on the songwriting action. Uh -huh. You're thinking of now someone else who's functioning as a, song, like a singing songwriting instrumentalist in there. I was thinking more just as a musician. But if it's someone yeah. that we we know grew to be a songwriter, who knows? I, I mean, don't know this why is an the hell the they would. Yeah, the, it is an off, off the wall, the wall yeah. question, but yeah. you know, I don't know why the hell they would bring in like another fully formed singing songwriting artist guy. But I mean, mm -hmm. can you? I mean, I could you? I don't know Graham Nash. Could you see him? You know, coming in, it's like you know, yeah, they they they've decided they want the front line to be four guys. And Ringo, mm. right? So, like, I could see Graham Nash, uh, or uh, who's the other guy in the Hollies that, that wrote songs with Alan Clark? Oh, uh, Tony yeah, Hicks. Maybe Alan Clark or Tony Hicks. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of like who, who would, who was in the, in the orbit. No, you know what? I'm going to stick to my original uh, assessment that it would be a keyboard player, like either either Georgie Fame or or Rod Argent. Okay. All right. Well, Darren is back. Let's hear it. <laughs> I have no idea what happened. It just went bluey on my end. And uh, and there was no way to to kind of get it up going again. Well, the every Zoom meeting, someone has to be the guy that leaves. It happens. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't think of a Zoom session I've ever been on where everybody was there for the duration. It looked like John might have froze. That was the first thing I noticed. And then it went, then the screen just went like it had been signed off. Yep. So what are we picking up with my... Uh... You can finish your thoughts on the Apple rooftop. Yeah. Why don't, no, I, we, uh, why don't thinking... I start that? It's just as easy to remember where I left off if I begin with the start. And I'll do the uh, intro quicker. Is that all right? We're not doing I, I mean... any editing here. We're not doing any editing here. Remember? All right. What did I do? I have no idea where I left you off. You were just about to tell us how you got. Wait, into are we live? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. I, Abbey Road. Right. I was talking yeah. about Abbey Road. How you got? To, how you got into yeah. studio two? I, I essentially called them up and said, uh, told them who I was, and it was just, you know, and I had my family with me, and that was not an issue, and it was a very nice uh, uh, employee of, of of Abbey Road Studios that was. Was they we even took us around and I was forty five minutes late because the very first time I'd went to London was on my honeymoon in in uh, nineteen ninety four and I thought I remembered how the, the, the where to walk out of the tube station in St John's Wood to get to the crosswalk thus to Abbey Road hmm. I was wrong so I had my kids <laughs> my wife and my mother traipsing all over London. <laughs> and we got to Abbey Road significantly late, and yet they still took us around. Oh. The kids, my mother, and everyone had a job because I spent <laughs> most of that time with my jaw wide open on the floor. Uh, my wife had the, had the camera. She was taking the pictures. And there were some pictures that are pretty interesting because it's the tour guide telling my mother what was going on, some of these still shots. Like, I kind of knew what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. The trip was the shot, and I think I have it on Facebook, my kids plunking on the piano or one of the mm -hmm. pianos that was there. You could tell this thing was 50, 60 years old. It looked like it mm -hmm. had been there. And you know that something was done on that piano that I've been listening to on, we've been listening to on Beatle Records forever. And my kids are there kind of like, you know, playing little rudimentary kind of kid things that they play on pianos. We went up the stairs to the control room, saw Studio 3. That was the extent of what we could do, but that was enough. Nice. So, you know, getting to see where it happened, and like I said, Woodstock and whatnot, the rooftop would be my place because my goal 
my next goal is to get up there on that roof. All right. Now, I, I don't know what's in the building at the moment. It was an Abercrombie and Fitch, but they moved out of that location. Mm -hmm. So because I had a whole plan about we'll go to Abercrombie and I have no idea if men shop in Abercrombie and Fitch because I wear jeans everywhere and T-shirts. Um, mm -hmm. But I had kind of had a way a plan that, you know, we go back and I kind of sweet talk somebody in the store into at least let me pop, poke my head out. So, uh, and yeah, I would, would love to have, have, have actually experienced the rooftop concert, January 30th, 69, whether I was down in the street uh, or on an, uh, an adjoining roof or an, across the street on another roof, just to, just to see that happening, how loud was it? Our interview with Peter Jackson on, uh, on things mm -hmm. we said today, Ken, uh, Peter made it sound like it was pretty loud, even yeah. down in the street, you know, just to experience be there when that happened even though it wasn't a real concert i probably would not have been at a location to be able to really see well but just i think to be present for that and we've all i think i don't know maybe i shouldn't assume been at least outside of the apple building on savile row mm -hmm. uh you have not john not you haven't not yet yeah it's it, not it's funny because it's mm -hmm. When you another example of the logistics of things, I find so fascinating. It's just like this busy London, very narrow London street, and you walk down, and if you didn't know any better, you just walk past. Mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. and I don't even think uh, this was on the first time I went was on my honeymoon. I found it by accident. We happened just to be walking near uh, Piccadilly Circus, which is right nearby. Right. And I just happened to catch the street sign, Savile Row. Mm -hmm. So after my wife picked me up off the ground, there was no right or left. There was only a left to walk right around. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my mm -hmm. God. There it is. This is it. This is it. It was like, this is it. Yeah. This. It was because it was it just you had this picture in your mind of these places that are like. Right. You know, there's like a golden glow constantly sure. on the door. Mm. It was like, this is it. Wow. An office building. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Have you been Have you been to Liverpool? Uh, my honeymoon. That was part of the honeymoon. We went to Liverpool. Uh, your, your wife is a saint, man. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> you around? I can't get her or the kids to go back. I am begging them. Really? I got to go back to Liverpool. Mm. Now we've been there already. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I did Liverpool. We 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 yeah. visited my aunt and uncle live in England, and uh, we took a trip up to Liverpool. We I didn't make any of the St John's Wood Abbey Road stuff, but we did mm -hmm. two days in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. We stayed in the city centre, which is near like where the cavern is and everything. All that. Mm -hmm. um, we did the National Trust tours of John and Paul's childhood homes. Yeah, and yeah. we're sitting in the McCartney living room. And the woman is talking about, and it was on this piano that, that James McCartney, Jim McCartney would sing songs with his sons. And does anyone have any questions? I was like, yeah. And I just, we had just taken the bus to the city, from city center to the thing. And it was like, it was this really like long ass trip. I was like, mm. how did they get from here to the cavern? She goes, they took the bus. I was like, what? Yeah, they, they would get on the bus with like all their equipment. and stuff like that and then we did a guided tour with jackie spencer i want to give her a plug because she's amazing absolutely if you do if you do a liverpool tour you have to do it with her um, must spend the money and seeing the streets like you say it's like this is yeah this is quarry bank high school this is the whatever whatever it is it just looks like a and it really brought their story to life yeah in a way that it was just it it makes it even more their story even more sort of like supernatural mm -hmm. the levels of the video game that they had to keep beating mm -hmm. to become right what they became and i did a similar thing um at saint peter's church because it's still a fun we got to the outside of it and i knew that it was inside in that room inside that room is where they met it's where john right. and paul met and is it open to the public no sorry it's not open to the public anyway here's the plaque and da -da 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 -da. i'm like uh-huh and I see a guy 
come through the door with like pushing chairs on a cart. Uh And I start like kind of walking toward it. And I hear Jackie go to this to this guy, this older. Do you mind if he takes a look inside? He's come all the way from New York. And the guy looks at me, goes, you know, there's nothing to see in there. He was like, "Here we go, here we go, another Funny. American." Be- he he must have he's seen that look mm. on people's faces from America, like ooh, and I. But I managed to f- be in like the room where they met, and it was like, "Whoa!" How big you is know? it? Not that big. I mean, it's like a it's like a basement, like a church basement sort of rec room. That's still it's okay. still a functioning church. That's the other thing about Liverpool is that it's not all like Beatle Museum stuff. This is like churches mm-hmm. that people still use. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, but, Liverpool you know, it, in two thousand and nine. I think I said two thousand four. Uh, well, our honeymoon was December uh, nineteen ninety four. My wife uh, lived in lived in uh, Wales for a time and. Uh, went to school in England. There's family there, so that was it. Was a, uh, the honeymoon was like a, a trip to London. Uh, the, did the sightseeing thing, which which was right up my alley, and then visited re- relatives and did a little of stuff for my wife up into Wales, and finished with a couple of days in Liverpool. The only problem was by that point we were spent. It was the yeah. end of two weeks, coming right out of the wedding, hmm. um, and Liverpool was a bit of a letdown because it was kind of like we're at the end we're tired we took the magical mystery tour around for the tour but it was a damp chilly night so the windows were all fogged up and you couldn't see anything outside i knew where i wanted to go the next day and my wife could drive on the other side of the road so the next day i did my own little with the map to penny lane go over around penny lane with the strawberry fields um I was really impressed with Ringo's neighborhood and how poor Dingle or yeah. the Dingle was. Mm. And, 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 and like I Still said, about the car, yeah. there's Ringo's school. I knew what it looked from the tour the day before. And like across the street, I'm like, holy smokes, that's the building from the cover of Sentimental Journey. The Empress yeah. Pub, yeah. 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 It looks exactly the same. And I'm taking pictures of it. This was back in the day, and I took some pictures of the school back at a time in 94 when you could get away with that. I probably would have been arrest, arrested today taking pictures of a school schoolyard. Right. But uh, anyway, when, back... When was that? This was in December 94. Oh, okay. And then I went back in 2007, mm-hmm. with again, with my family, and it was part of a bigger reason that we were there, that right. we did a little more London, and that's when I got in Abbey Road. Um, and uh, on my Facebook page, I think there's pictures buried on there, but they're there, and it's like my visit to Abbey Road. They're labeled, and they're all laid out there. Nice. I was so much thinner. Anyway, uh, but I apologize for going off on a tangent. It was the rooftop concert would be, you know, would be my pick because of the, you know, the historic nature of it. And if not that, sure. if it's got to be a real concert with a real crowd, uh, Shea Stadium first show or second show okay very good you guys are reminding me that i got to go back to to england because i only went oh to me too yeah, yeah, yeah. i made a lot of mistakes going there because it wasn't really a beetle tour and i spent much more time in london than i did in liverpool me too but i did um go to liverpool and i remember the the train ride from london was a long yeah. ride yeah two, yes. two and a half hours yeah, yeah. And uh, we did stop at the Empress Pub, and I usually tell this story that I that I got off the train and I took the camera out, and there was this boy who was on a bicycle, and he drove in front of the Empress, and he wore the same kind of cap hat that John Lennon wore, in a hard day's night, and he turned to me and he said, "Ringo Starr used to live there, mate," and then he drove off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's similar to what happened when we were at school. When I was taking pictures of the school, all the kids who were like really little, that's why I say today, they would have probably locked me up. Yeah. All these little school girls come walking over to this nut taking pictures. Mm. And they're asking me, and I'm like, well, I'm from New York City. And a few a few girl, a few of the kids knew the significance, knew a Beatle Ringo had gone mm. to their school like centuries ago. And I told them, well, I'm here from New York and I'm a fan. And 
Um, you know, I think one kid actually was a little sad, said it's not a very nice school or it was, it was poor. It looked poor. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, no. I said, believe me, where I went to high school, this is great. Yeah. But, I mean, as but, a, we were there in 2018 and it was still, the dingle was still like funky, man. Yeah. It, and, little, it, and it really, and I, it, I, it reminded me of Bushwick, actually, where Harry yeah. Nilsson is from. Yeah. And I thought this, this must be why Harry and Ringo got along so well. You know what I mean? There's something about coming from a, 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 a place that's like, I mean, most places get gentrified eventually, but the dingle was still like, yeah. was still pretty, pretty funky. I mean, even Liverpool, which reminded me a little of Queens, uh, just in, in that, and it was getting dark and it seemed to be closing up like if you were in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I said to my wife, I'm like, it's a, I know I'm from the Bronx, but why am I a little like nervous walking around here now at night? You know, had to go to a, we had a resort to eating a McDon at a McDonald's right down the block from the cavern hmm. because there were no places open to eat. At yeah. least we didn't want to go venture and look for them. Uh, and I'm from the Bronx and I'm nervous about being in Liverpool. Right. You know, we still got to get the ferry across the Mersey to, to the town across the way that we were staying in. And so I want to go back and do it again. And we'll see yeah. if, if I succeed in brain uh, in bribe uh, in uh, talking to my family into you know. <laughs> well, I hope I can get to my wife because we talked years and years about going on Charles Rosenay's trips to England. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that part of me. There have been years when it's part Hamburg along with London. And yes, London, and mm -hmm. I want that more than anything. Part of right. me is just as interested in Hamburg as I am with with Liverpool. Yeah. But he hasn't done that for several years. But I might, I might do it next year. I definitely want to go back. Yeah, It'd be really just be saturated with Liverpool. Spent a whole week in Liverpool alone. And really, and has anyone stayed or or seen uh, a Hard Day's Night hotel? John, did you see it or? No. No, I'm no, curious. We, st we stayed at the. Um, I forget the name of the hotel. It was it's some English like chain some english hotel chain that's like the the um la quinta inn of of, yeah. of england i forget what it was called but it was very nice it just didn't you know it, was, it wasn't i wasn't there to get you know a fancy hotel i was more impressed with the jacaranda than anything anywhere else i gotta tell you this is 2018 the jacaranda is on slater street um it's like just outside the city center and their attitude is like we are not a part of the beatles history the beatles are a part of our history mm -hmm. so their attitude is the jacaranda has its own history of presenting like local rock and roll r b bands a lot of what they call steel bands a lot of caribbean uh music there mm -hmm. um and art scene uh in that in that place and then it was closed down for a while and then this guy i, for, I forget his name I, I i corresponded with him i wrote an article about it for culture sonar he acquired the jacaranda the club and was looking to reopen it somehow and he thought well how shall i do this he's like i don't want to do another touristy beatles stop mm. and so he started going back and looking at the history of the club through the years all these other you know, local Liverpool bands that play there and, and really sort of exalting the local scene. Like it's a very rich tradition in, in, in Liverpool of, of music and art and, and culture. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got, they have bands that play there, local live bands that play there. They have DJs. Um, I think he's got a second location that, and he's also got like a record label going. But the main location on Slater Street upstairs there are these booths that you can sit in like a pub that have turntables in the table and there's a record shop upstairs as well there's like a small record store you can buy records but you can also take records down and listen to them so uh -huh. the night i went in there there are these two guys in there like having a pint listening to elo's uh, out of the blue <laughs> on the turntable and very nice like craft beer selection and cake they have cakes 
and they've got this vintage voiceograph machine, like the thing you go in the booth and you sing, you put three shillings in, you sing, and then it and it cuts a, a plastic disc nice. of uh, of your voice. It's a really like funky place. And then, but then downstairs in the basement, there's a portion of the wall that's got like the mural that John and Stu painted. It's been Oops. like, I mean, this is like 19. 50 something so it's like there's very little of it left but they've got it like covered in glass but they are very much looking toward the future right the present day with it with the jacaranda and i and i to be honest i i preferred that to the cavern i saw the cavern was a little goofy when i went it was a little touristy you know but the jacaranda is like just a hip spot to go to like on its own we loved liverpool we thought i i, I asked my wife like what is this this reminds you of Paris. It reminds you of New York. What does it remind? She goes, "This is its own vibe. It's mm. got its own mm. character to it." You know. Gotta yeah. go back. Yeah. I gotta go back. <laughs> Me well, too. Karen, why don't we resume our last question? <laughs> uh, All right. So you you asked the second question. Yes. Okay. The question A good was. One. Um. Let me get the question out here. Yeah, the question Perfectly was asked so weird. long ago, you forgot it. <laughs> if you could pick a musician while the Beatles were together that you would want in the band as a fifth Beatle, who would you want? It has to be a musician at that time. And again, I'm not talking about, as everybody talks about the fifth Beatle being George Martin or, or Billy Preston or Brian Epstein. It has to be a musician, Billy Preston, could be one of them that you think would have worked well in the Beatles as a musician. I'm not even I'm not even saying that it has to be someone who would write songs in the Beatles, but someone that would complement the others. Since you always hear about a fifth Beatle, and given their history, and you know, it's fun to talk about who the fifth Beatle was. Is there anybody as a musician that you think from that time would have worked well in the band? Well, I'm going to leave out. Billy Preston for the obvious, it's an ob too obvious, but I would think that a keyboard player would probably, hmm. you know, make the most sense. You don't need three guitarists. The Beatles wouldn't warrant a second drummer. Uh, so I, I tell you who popped into my head, but I don't really know if he just popped into my head was, would be Steve Winwood. Hmm. Um. But there you have would have an issue where you would have uh, an established significant major vocalist slash songwriter coming into, you know, this, where is it, where is he going to fit? True. You know, like a baseball team that's already got an all-star shortstop and get is, is not going to really, a second all-star shortstop isn't really going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so while Winwood popped into my head, um this is a toughie i know uh, if, I, if i had to keep it to keyboard, perhaps maybe someone like someone like gary brooker that's who i thought of yeah i mean here you have a guy who's a composer he wasn't a, i mean he i'm not saying he never wrote lyrics but the lyrics end of things was taken care of in procol harem uh keith reed uh, i think wrote wrote all the words um um, right, that's his name, Keith Reed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and a strong vocalist who would be able to complement the composing end of things. So maybe Gary Brooker would work. Um, and you know, later on in in in, in the sixties, I mean, Billy Preston's like the only key, keyboard player that we associate with them. And once they stopped touring and they weren't package tours anymore you don't really hear about the Beatles having any bands or individual band members that they were very close and associated with. The Stones didn't have a keyboard player. You kept hearing Clapton guitar, but that would be three guitarists. I don't know. I'll stick with Gary Brooker. Gary Brooker on keyboards, vocals, mm. and, uh, you know. Yeah. See, the tough thing is, if you already know the history of people like Gary Brooker, or Steve Winwood, and you already know how much they contributed to their bands and being songwriters, you think that they'd have to have a, a bigger role in the Beatles. And that would probably conflict a lot with John and Paul and George. I tell you, I tell you actually another, uh, maybe a better pick 
but it would kind of change the dynamic of, of the Beatles. And it would be at the bitter end because he kind of became, he, he kind of emerged uh, in 69, would be somebody that I was close friends with actually, who recently passed away, Ian McDonald from King Crimson, uh, who was a huge Beatles fan. Um, and a lot of what he did with Crimson and even later on was all sort of influenced by the Beatles and growing up and listening, you know, seeing them on TV and buying their records as a kid growing up. Uh, Ian would play keyboards. Ian could play sax. We'd have a sax player in the Beatles, which would work. Hmm. Um, and um, uh, didn't really, uh, wasn't much, he didn't really write words, a composer. So maybe somebody a little, um, if the Beatles would have had to stay together though, uh, into the seventies a bit, because. Right. Ian McDonald, his, his stay in King Crimson was all 69. Right, I was going to say, what, what era of Crimson was he 70. in? Who was that? What, I was going to say, what era of Crimson was he in? He was an original right. member. He was he there at the first album. Okay. And he left the band as soon as they finished their first American tour at the end of 69, because I just think it was a, it was a little too much, too fast. It was too big. Um, uh, for him and their drummer, Michael Giles, who also uh, attempted to leave. And Greg Lake saw that this was all very fragile. And he was already talking to Keith Emerson about doing something. So he had one foot out the door. And um, so Gary Brooker slash Ian McDonald. Okay. Final answer. Good choices. All right, Al, your thoughts. Okay. Um, okay. Thinking about, okay. Steve Winwood, unless you're talking about, you know, the teenage Steve Winwood, you know, who had just emerged from um, uh, from the Spencer Davis group. Mm -hmm. And uh, and John mentioned uh, mentioned Georgie fame. Mm -hmm. They would both be they would both be really good, good choices, except that maybe that, you know, they might have been a little too bluesy, jazzy for you know, for the Beatles sound. So I thought of somebody and also, you know, there's like also a geographic thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, and, and Darren, the Stones did have a keyboard player. Okay, Ian Stewart. Yeah. Ian Stewart, yeah. Right. Uh, and I thought of him as well. Um, but thought, well, how about somebody that's uh, geographically a little, a little, you know, a similar you know, the, you know, would be, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Anyway, uh, somebody who would be, you know, would be a better match. And the guy I thought of was, you can, you'll love this. Huh. Denny Lane. Okay. Yeah. It you know, he, like, considering how well he worked with Paul later on. Exactly. You know, uh, they, in fact, that's, uh, that's how Paul got to know him was actually when, when the Moody Blues toured as a supporting act, the Beatles in the 65, 64, 65 uh, British tour. And I mean, you know, Denny could play, could play keyboards and it'd be a little, be probably a little bit more pop oriented than, um, than say a Steve Winwood or a Georgie Fame. Uh, plus he could play guitar. Um, he might might have might have fit a little better. No, I so think that I would, makes very good sense to me. Yeah. I mean obviously normally I would just go with the chalk and say Billy Preston. Yeah. You know. But uh, uh, but I yeah, it just happened to pop into my mind that, you know, that 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 Denny Lane might uh, might be a better match. Hmm. Okay, those are excellent choices. I might go with Denny there. I hadn't thought about him, but yeah. Really good choices from the three of you. Okay, so question number three. What one person, alive or dead, besides the other Beatles, would you most have wanted Paul to collaborate with as a songwriter that he has never written songs with? Okay. 
so. You think about the major ones in Paul's post Beatles career, Denny Lane, who we just mentioned, Eric Stewart, Elvis Costello, someone of that nature could do a, you know, a decent amount of songwriting with Paul McCartney, someone that Paul never has written with. Okay. Who would that be if you could pick one person? All right. And this time, who did I start? Oh, I started with uh, Darren the last time, right? No, he started with me the last time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so Darren, Darren. you're first. <laughs> it's hard. I know. It's hard to pick one, too. I have a bunch of them. Have you ever thought of certain mm. people that you think would really work well with Paul? I don't know if I ever actually ever gave it much of a thought. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know he always struck me that other than Lennon, it's it, it seemed as though, and 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 maybe to a lesser extent, Denny Lane. It seemed as though any collaborations never really ended up going that far. Whether it's you know was ego or whatever the case is, Ian Stewart, uh, Ian Stewart, uh, Eric Stewart didn't that didn't fit. And Elvis cost something when I'm not sure what something went a little wrong with the Elvis Costello collaboration. Hmm. Well, um, I, would, I wouldn't say that Eric Stewart didn't fit. I mean, it was short lived as far as it song didn't, it didn't, something something yeah. wasn't it was a little oil and water ish. It didn't allow it to grow and go further hmm. well, um, with Eric Stewart, you think? Yeah. Really? Well, there was a huge problem with Press to Play, which you probably all know about, that originally Eric thought that he was going to be the producer, and then eventually Hugh Padgham was used, and um, both Hugh and Eric didn't like the outcome <laughs> of the album. Hugh wasn't crazy about the songs that Paul came up with, and Eric didn't like the production that you came up with. But uh, I think after several years of working with Paul, on Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, and Broad Street, he really wanted to have a major role in Press to Play. And originally, so, it, you know, this is what we've heard, that Eric was going to be the main producer working with Paul on that. And then that changed. So, you know, you've got those songs there on, on Press to Play. You got a few others that ended up on 10CC records, right. you know, and that's it. So, um, you know. I have, uh, I have two. I had, I went from having none to having two. <laughs> and, uh, um, the first person I thought of was Sting. McCartney and Sting point. could actually be a very, very fascinating combination, but you got two bass players there. So I don't know if that even matters. I don't know what this collaboration is going to end up being. If it's going to be just songwriting, it wouldn't matter. Well, that's uh, the, that's what I was really pointing to is the songwriting. Although, if, yeah, would love to if see they played playing together. If yeah. They toured together or played together to support. Would it be like kind of like a have to have like a lightsaber battle on who gets to play <laughs> bass? On, <laughs> um, the other person them... I thought of is is Paul Simon. Oh yeah. What if McCartney and Paul Simon sat down and 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 wrote an album together, Paul and Paul? <laughs> um, that would have been that would be that would have been I think fascinating. It'd be interesting to also see how that would work, knowing how John and Paul worked, and we talked about the other people that worked with McCartney, other collaborators, other producers. Um, you know, it always seemed that when another producer came in you didn't end up hearing a second or, you know, I would love to have heard another album produced by Nigel Godrich. Cause I think he oh brought, God. he brought out, you know, but I don't think they necessarily got along. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sting and or Paul Simon. I think I thought of Paul Simon because Sting and Paul Simon toured together. And I saw that tour. Um, and that was great. So. All right. Well, yeah. Paul Simon's always been a dream of mine. Yeah. You know, to work with any of the Beatles. And I always like to bring up how much I treasure that moment when he was with George Harrison mm. on Saturday Night Live and how well they sounded together. 
And, you know, between John Paul and George and Paul Simon, they are masters of harmony. And just, you know, to hear Paul Simon with George Harrison sing together, I'm sure it would have been wonderful with John and wonderful still with Paul, you know. But, uh, you know, Paul Simon's one of the absolute greats. And, you know, Sting is such a tremendous talent. It's just hard for me to imagine two bass players together like that. Yeah. Even though, you know, mm. Paul is well-rounded and can play anything. So. It might be an opportunity if they toured together for one of them to, you know, for them to take turns kind of playing other instruments. Wouldn't it be wild to see, like, Sting and Paul McCartney on tour and for a couple of tunes, McCartney plays drums? Mm -hmm. Oh, Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or, or or gets, you know, the lead guitar gets his, you know, gets to play a few couple of songs, which he does on his own tours, but where he's the lead guitarist, Sting handled bass for these songs. And Uh-huh. Well, I was saying fun. that when, when Paul just did his recent shows and Bruce Springsteen joined him, how much of a joy it was to see that Paul backed up Bruce on his song yeah. Yeah. instead of a Paul McCartney song. And so to see Paul play the bass on um glory days wouldn't it be great to see paul play bass yeah. on a sting song <laughs> and have sting return the compliment play bass on one of paul's songs yeah you know that'd be really cool all right john wow so you've 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 brought up a lot of interesting uh conceptual things mm -hmm. you know because we were talking about collaboration there's songwriting, there's just purely, we're gonna sit down and like write some songs and they'll wind up, one of us will record them or we'll give them to people or whatever, versus actual collaborations, right? And, you know, well, Darren, song, you kind of- Songwriting itself is a collaboration. Right, right. But I mean, there's like, when he and Steve Miller worked together, mm -hmm. when he played drums on My Dark Hour or something like that, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if they wrote that together. No. Okay. So there's so collaboration. Collaboration manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And when you're talking about Paul McCartney, you're talk. You're not just talking about some some guy you're going to write songs with. There's a history there. This is an institution. This is this is like the Lincoln Memorial. I mean the the. It's. I mean. And to to your earlier point about Eric Stewart and Ian, uh, uh, Nigel Godrich, his track record in terms of like, hey, I think it would be interesting to work with this person. It doesn't last very long because how are you going to compete? I'm I'm sorry, I'll, I, and I hate to phrase it this way. How are you going to compete with like the ghost of John Lennon? Like this guy's mm. pedigree, mm. like. The after once you've written songs with John Lennon, once you, you you came up writing songs with John Lennon, how are you gonna find anyone else that's gonna kick your ass the way Lennon did, or and 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 vice versa? So it would have to be someone who is either on 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 either end of of the spectrum of either someone who is his peer. I'm thinking of Keith Richards. I'm thinking of Pete Townsend, somebody that can walk into a room with him and not go, "Oh my God, you're Paul McCartney," you, you, you know, who can who can look this guy in the eye and say, "Ah, let's fix that because it's not," you know, and not have Paul go, "Well, who the fuck are you? I'm Paul McCartney. I wrote Hey Jude. Are you telling me?" Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or on the other end of the spectrum, maybe so, like a younger artist who has no that doesn't isn't aware of any of the Beatles baggage and none of that history. Mm -hmm. Someone who is like, yeah, there's this dude want, wants me to write some songs with him and who's not impressed with all that. Maybe somebody like D'Angelo. Right. Mm -hmm. Someone from completely out of left field, mm -hmm. um, you know, because in the middle you've got like like if he was going to sit down and work with Dave Grohl. Let's say massive power imbalance you know people always ask me hey do you think the beatles would have gotten back together if john lennon were alive and i always say no because in 1979 
the Guinness goddamn Book of World Records voted Paul McCartney the most successful songwriter in the history of the planet Earth. And you're going to tell me that two years after that, he's going to play bass on a George Harrison song? I don't think so. It's not going to happen. Mm. There's just the, 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 the power imbalance is just too great there. I and I think, think this has been... That What's that? I don't think Paul thinks that way. Okay. Well, That's I, it's, my opinion, but yeah. Uh, Good point. I, I mean, I would love to be proven wrong at that, but it just se- it just seems to me that there was, you know, I, I, I just feel like his legacy is so insurmountable. He's unique in that regard. There's few artists that like, that you, you walk into the room with them and there's like no room for like anybody else. And I think this has been Paul's problem over the years, looking for a collaborator that's got the balls to look at him and go like, yeah, that that's, Eh, you know that's that was George, Nigel Godrich. That was Nigel Godrich, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We saw what happened to him. You know, yes. George. And I think exactly. George. Yeah, they he lasted for one album, which I think is, yeah. I think, one of his best ever. If you ask no me, doubt. If you ask a creation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, even George Martin, when he got back with George Martin, the famous story about like you know what? Yeah, we should work together again. And George Martin says, "All right, well, let's hear your songs and." We'll see how it's, you know, we'll see what happens. And Paul goes, you mean I've got to pass an audition? You know, like, but George Martin was like the one guy mm. that would say, no, do another take or that bridge needs mm. work. There's very few people that can get in a room and have the balls to tell Sir Paul McCartney the bridge is weak or this this needs another section or, mm. or whatever, you know, to give him that kind of, direction that he'll take maybe now it would be different i'm not sure but like i think all of us are familiar enough with the history to know that him finding a collaborator that's really gonna get him to sort of step outside of his comfort zone you know i'm thinking of stevie wonder the stuff they did together was killing Mm -hmm. um you know i don't care i love ebony and ivory i don't care what anybody says i love it absolutely Uh, you know and what's that you're doing the other track they did together on, on tug of war i'd love to see more from the from the two of them um but like yeah a, I'm, a full album with those two together right well that's the thing i mean how would that i mean he's there's really he has no peer in the industry i mean well, uh, unless you go to somebody like keith which from what i understand i think they've written some stuff i think they like were hung they hung out together on a vacation a couple of years ago and were noodling the guitar Paul's talked about it i don't know if the song was finished but they did write something together i think that would be that would be certainly uh something very interesting and i would love to see him and pete townsend hmm. uh uh do something together um paul simon i'm not i'm not so sh- i don't know that he's co-written stuff with with people That's i don't know I, I don't know i don't know what he would be like as a as a mm. collaborator right. or sting for that matter although i will say you know you tell me about uh, paul simon and, and, and george mm. there's a great video clip on youtube of paul yes. simon and john lennon uh on the grammys oh, yeah. Yeah. together yes uh introducing uh i forget which category it is it's 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 it's, it's simon yeah. Lennon and uh and I think it was Williams. record of the year yeah yeah. Mm. yeah yeah and he seems to be like holding his own with lennon in terms of like oh sorry in terms of being uh you know with the uh with the joking around and stuff like that that's but, an interesting uh, idea yeah, you raised a good point there john because a few times I, I like to point out that one of the most revealing things that paul has ever said uh he, he did this on, in a couple of interviews he said let's face it denny lane is not john lennon stevie wonder is not john lennon mm-hmm. um i mean come on stevie wonder <laughs> it's one of the greatest talents you've ever had in music why does everything need to be a comparison if if he could collaborate with somebody and just create something good and enjoyable it doesn't have to be compared to the beatles you know why can't why can't that just be a concern? Why must everything be compared to what he did with John or for what John brought to him? What if another songwriter would bring something else out of him? That that's, John why I'm think, that's why I'm yeah. thinking of somebody younger who's yeah. not as affected by 
that legacy and that and that history. Um, you know, maybe maybe one of the guys from, you know, one of the guys from, you know, like like one of the like an indie band like Spoon or or one of the Death Cab for Cutie guys. Yeah. You know, somebody somebody who's not impressed and he's like, look. I don't care. I don't care if you are, if you were in the Beatles. This is a crap song, man. We got to, we got to take this and, and it needs to be punched up, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, hopefully, Paul would have you know the wherewithal to be like, oh, okay, it's you know. I mean, it would it would be it's really up to him to whether he's going to be like. I mean, besides the songwriting with Elvis Costello, we did some great bass playing. Mm -hmm. There's some, oh, yeah. some a couple of great bass lines on Spike. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and he's, I mean, and we know that he's capable of it because he's, he, he turns up now and then like playing drums on the Steve Miller track or playing bass with this one or whatever. He's capable of kind of like slipping in there, you know, uh, I think him and Prince could have, uh, I bring up Prince. Could have <laughs> done something interesting because they both have that thing where they're a complete entity unto themselves, but they're always up for doing something kind of like sneaky and uh and crazy all those songs that that prince would write and like give away under mm -hmm. an assumed name like manic monday yeah you yeah. know that mysterious gemini thing you know also i think prince is like fearless he just does whatever the hell he wants and paul needs somebody like that sometimes right paul, who else paul's right. too self-conscious about what he what he's doing Except yeah. when he does something under a different name, like the fireman. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so there you go. So there's him and youth, mm -hmm. right? I, I think it would have to be, the more I think about it, it would either have to be someone, like some young dude that like no one's ever heard of, some indie guy, mm. or he'd have to reach back to the old guard uh, and, and the two guys that come to mind in that respect or Keith and, and uh, Pete Townsend. Mm. Okay. Good choices. Mm. Al, what mm. would be yours? Well, when you th think of all of the various musical genres that Paul has been involved with over the years, there's one common thread that goes all the way back to the early Beatles, and that's R&B. You know, even back in the early days, if you look at the the old, uh, you know, the the Beatles fact sheets of, you know, what they what they liked, you hear you see Ray Charles, mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye, Chuck Jackson, you know, later on, you know, uh, he he absolutely showed his his fandom for uh, for Stevie Wonder, and of course, obviously worked with them later. Mm -hmm. Same with Michael Jackson. Um, what I was thinking was that somebody, uh, you know, uh, John just mentioned Prince, but I thought, well, I don't know, Prince might be a little too um, temperamental, perhaps. Um, I the, think person I that I, <laughs> the person that I thought of huh. who would be who would be, I think, I think are an excellent collaborator, uh, not only as a songwriter, but also as a producer uh, and as a player, Niall Rogers. Ah, yes. Yeah. Good one. I've wanted that too, you know? because Niall is a huge Beatles fan and he's admitted. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You know, and he, I mean, he's, you know, he's a great guitarist. You know his uh, you know, his influence on you know on hip hop is legion, um, and you know he's a, he's a great producer, mm -hmm. um, and I think I think he would you know give give Paul just you know the, that kind of R and B uh, flavor, you know, just as a as a collaborator. Mm -hmm. That's a great choice. It is, especially uh, thinking that now Rogers worked with Bowie when Bowie was looking. Yes. For, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. tap it to make a more commercial record, of, and Let Stance came out of that. Mm -hmm. I think he would also 
be, you know, the, first of all, let's also not forget Niles' work with Duran Duran, the Notorious yeah. album. Mm-hmm. Killing, killing. And was he, did he do, did he produce the power station? No, Bernard Edwards produced the power station. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, he produced the but Mick yeah. Solo. Say again? He produced some Mick Jagger. This is true. I oh. think, Ooh, that's right. I think, I think that's, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent choice because I, um, I think he would be able to not only musically, but again, you're dealing with McCartney, you're dealing with a very unique uh, personality, you know, who, who we, we know just the history, you know, shows that he, I, I don't think this is a guy who likes to be told what yeah. to do. I don't mm-hmm. think this is someone who likes hearing the word no, try it again you know, from anybody other than John Lennon or George Martin. Right. And, and yet he I think, works with a lot of producers. He does, but, right, but he chews them up and spits them out, though. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he works with a lot of producers because, you know, the, you know, because uh, unlike, unlike somebody like Mark Hudson, who was able to, you know, get with Ringo for like several years, because he yeah. like, Mark Hudson, apart from Richard Perry, I think was the the one producer that I think got the best stuff out of Ringo mm-hmm. because he yeah, knew, he, yeah. he understood he understood Ringo's legacy and didn't want to like run from that. He was able to sort of like keep the Beatle influence in there in a very sort of tasteful, natural, enjoyable kind of way, but he also knew exactly how to utilize Ringo's talents where his where his voice sounds best what you know uh, uh you know how to use his drumming you know what what to, you know what to do with him as a producer he really created a setting for Ringo that I thought was excellent mm-hmm. um but he I think part of as, as any producer will tell you there's the site there's a psychology uh aspect to it you know Clarence Avant said that about Quincy Jones right as Plenty of arrangers who were as good as Quincy. Plenty of orchestrators who were as good, probably even better than Quincy. Quincy has mastered the art of people. Quincy knows how to make people feel comfortable so that they'll do their best work. And I think Nile Rodgers is someone that would know how to sort of navigate the, 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 the McCartney sort of ecosystem. Because I, I have to imagine that like when you step into a room with that guy, there's like, there's nobody else in the room. Mm. I have to imagine, I've never met him, I've never been in a room that he's been in, but everything I've heard is just sort of like, I have a, I have a friend who's who's very friendly with someone who's close to Paul and he's, and he's been in a couple of social situations with him. Mm. And it's like, there's a vibe, he said. He says, you speak when you're spoken to, when that guy's in the room, right? Mm. And so, to have that following you around all the time, a producer that's going to go, yeah, I, I, th- I think yeah. You, you got a better one in you. To be able to speak up like that and not have your mm-hmm. head cut off, I think Nile Rogers would have that that ability to do that. He's got the pedigree to back that good, up. Exactly. You know? Noise now. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought about Nile Nile Rogers a lot when it comes to mm-hmm. Paul, especially because I also like you know his stuff with Chic and you know the disco mm-hmm. stuff. All right, excellent choices again. So we have one last question. It's another one that I think would is kind of difficult to answer. But what one Beatles recording from their core catalog do you think could most likely become a hit record today if released as a single? And it could be a song that was already a hit. When you look back to 1986 it was when twist and shout was a hit all over again because it was in ferris bueller's day off it was re-released as a single it made the top 40 every now and then you will find some old song out there like dreams from fleetwood mac which was in a tiktok video and all of a sudden it's back on the charts it made i think the top 20 again in america you've got uh you know kate bush running up that hill being a big hit all over again. Um, is there any song that you think 
could work in this day and age, whether it's in a movie, a, a TV show, a video, anything where you think it could chart very well as a Beatles single. I know we all love the catalog, but thinking in terms of what could work and what sells today, is there any song that you think really stands out above all the others, even if it was a hit already, that could be a hit again in 2022 as we do this? All right, let me start with, Darren's still pondering. John is pondering. Al is pondering. They're all pondering. <laughs> mm, is that a word, pondering? It is now. Yeah. <laughs> I do, but I feel like I'm pondering. I really it's like, do. Yeah. It's like worse than pondering. It's, it's yeah. yeah. That's funny. Well, then, I, then I made it up. Al, yeah. why don't I start with you? It's like an okay. in his own right kind of word. It's not a real word, but it sounds like it means something, you know? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What is pondering? Mm. Um, the one that just you know that pops into my head right away is something that that could um, that could do fairly well. Of course, these days the, you know the charts are so different mm. from from what they were, you know, fifty fifty five years ago. Um, the one that comes to mind actually is come together. Hmm. In fact, I, uh, I hear that a lot on, in various formats of variants of rock radio, either hmm. classic rock, um, you know, Darren's, uh, AAA, um, things like that. And, um, you know, even though stylistically it might not be, you know, kind of in line with what's with what's popular now. Um, I think it's just, you know, it's it's offbeat enough, not literally, but uh, that that it could it could do it could do well. Yeah, I suppose, especially if it worked. <clears throat> pardon me if it were tagged to a um, you know a movie or a tv show or something mm -hmm. you know um so yeah i'll go with, i'll go with come together you know i mentioned in one of my recent shows i forget which one that uh come together is the number one beatles track on classic rock radio and it has been for right years now Anytime I'm listening to a classic rock station and they're about to pre-announce a Beatles song, I say to my wife, I'll bet you it's come together. And most of the time, it's yeah. come together. And when it's not, it's revolution. Yeah. Yeah, could be, let it be sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I often wonder why, and that is, a, you know, as much as I love come together, I love so many Beatles songs, why single that one out as testing so well and, and maybe the fact that um, it got even more credibility through Aerosmith and their version of the song. Maybe that has something to do with it. That's no, a possibility. Uh, but yeah, that's a show to itself. Why has come together the most <laughs> well-tested Beatles song on classic rock radio? The most mm -hmm. song right now, anyway. All right, um, Darren, how about you? Power to the people. We're talking yeah, about like today, in today's uh, volatile, you know, setting that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a song that's ripe for to become an, an anthem again for someone. Um, power to the people. It's, it's just plain and simple. You know, it's, it's generic enough that it can be used by someone in a way that could end up being the, the the thing that makes makes it makes a hit today whatever that is i don't even have a clue you know how, what that is today a hit what mm. you know uh so power to the people because of you know it just seems as though every other every other week there's some new issue in the world that is ruffling feathers and maybe stirring up protests and whatnot 
Okay, well, that's an excellent choice. And I certainly think it's got one of the catchiest, despite very simple chorus. Um, but I was referring to the group catalog. Just with the Beatles that has a band. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Revolution, for the same reason. Because uh, I thought of that too. And I missed you said, I, I missed you saying that with the, of the Beatles catalog, but Revolution, which has had over the years, little bursts of of uh, popularity again or use whether it's in a commercial or whatnot but for the same reason power to the people revolution maybe revolution would even be timelier because it's a little more of an aggressive i don't know revolution similar reason if not the same reason i picked power to the people mm. okay i can also tie that into the fact that with the beatles gave us was a revolution <laughs> you tie that to the beatles image as well uh john what would you pick so are we just to be clear are we talking about a song being released as a single like like as is like the recording yep. being re-released like they did in the 70s when they put out like helter skelter as a single yeah got to get you into my stuff life like that got to get you in my life was a single yeah okay so i still do a lot of uh like wedding gigs and club dates and things like that where i'm often tasked with learning the popular songs of the day mm -hmm. and <laughs> i have now i just turned 50 and i'm now at the age where i go like i don't understand what, what young people are doing with music <laughs> anymore it's just I'm like music. it's like a, just like a like a a, a four bar chord progression that loops over and over again with some person carrying on and on about their life and then it stops at some point you know and I'm like this you know it's it's a lot of electronic stuff mm -hmm. you don't really hear like rock bands anymore so I'm trying to so I'm 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 considering a landscape that consists of like Lil Nas X and Dua Lipa artists like that again like darren like you said like i don't know what a, what's a hit song now. yeah who's i yeah. mean we're all all of us are old enough to remember you know casey Kasem's america's top oh, 40 yeah. where like everybody knew what the number one song in the country was mm -hmm. right gun to my head i couldn't you tell know you how it got there too oh you know no no i mean no. and you knew how it got there exactly you know how yeah. it got you know why exactly. it was a hit Right, you know, right. Today it's like it, it was streamed on phones, or uh, it was, you know, it was used in a commercial for right. fifteen seconds. Right. Well, then, and, and, yeah, the and you'll have and you'll have like a burst of popularity, right? For for like a week, you know, break my stride became like a TikTok. Yeah. So I actually interviewed Matthew Wilder for a Culture mm -hmm. Sonar article about that. A friend uh -huh. of mine works with him. And he's like, I don't know where it came from. I said, how did this thing start? He says, I have no idea. <laughs> he says, I, I, I start these, I, it was like checks started showing up in the mail. He said, that's all I know. He says, my, my niece told me that I'm viral on TikTok. Oh, that's interesting. And then it became like millions and millions. Who knows how it happened? Just random, right? Or dreams, uh, you know, so, songs from the past will reappear in some other kind of context mm -hmm. um so i thought of come together i i'm but because i'm i'm thinking in terms of you know from uh, from a uh, compositional perspective i'm also thinking sonically yeah what's what's going to cut through what's going to what kind of sounds are going to grab someone's ear so the sound of like the band playing is probably like so something like she loves you wouldn't is, isn't going to think no. I'm thinking of come together. I'm, I'm thinking of songs that sound interesting. Baby, you're a rich man. Mm -hmm. uh, as a yeah. at the beginning, which is him hitting the dampening the bass strings. Yeah. Um, but then every once in a while, you'll have a some weird artsy Taylor Swift song that goes on for 11 minutes. You know that they, uh, you know, so I'm thinking maybe Strawberry Fields might cut through the clutter mm. and 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 have all the young people going like ooh, what's that you know mm. like what's going to get people's attention 
as opposed to it being like we've re-released this Beatles song and here mm-hmm. it is you know like like twist and shout in the 80s like right. everybody heard oh yeah it's twist and shout from 20 years ago I'm thinking of like what in their catalog would a young person whose Spotify playlist consists of you know Lil this one and Lil that one and Dua Lipa mm-hmm. would 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 uh, like which Beatles track would wind up on that playlist and have them go oh that's cool what is that you know so it would, I'm, I'm thinking of something from the studio the later studio era mm-hmm. th- you know come to come together maybe something off the white album yeah um, you know what I mean mm-hmm. I wish I had like the the answer but you know I kind of wish the production element would be so important, but sometimes sonically you listen to the early Beatles stuff and you hear a big difference between that and the later Beatles stuff. And you can tell it's a lot older, mm-hmm. but still the songs are great and that should cut through anyway. But um, yeah. Well, there I is also a lot of that retro like imitation R&B retro stuff that Amy Winehouse made popular. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe something like Anna might mm. get people's attention or do you, or do you want to know a secret you know something that's got enough sort of space in it mm-hmm. um you know but then again you know darren to your point about the charts there's a million different charts now yeah yeah the country chart it. the pop chart the latin chart there's a there's a lot of different it's broken up into a lot of different genres and some of the modern country music that i hear is like produced sound of a of a band live rhythm section vocals verse chorus verse chorus bridge you know songs the way we know them to be mm-hmm. so so who knows maybe uh you know something off of, of a of a of a please please me uh might get people's attention today who knows well like i said there are those instances of certain older songs just thinking about um Baby Blue. From yeah. That. Right. Big yeah. Brain. And, yeah. and i give you another one. I've uh, been recently listen, uh, watching The Crown. And there was an episode that is happening in 1967. And they used um, the Four Seasons Beggin. Oh, wow. And, and if I'm not mistaken, around the time that that particular episode aired um it actually made as john was just saying you know about the eight zillion different charts that are out there now um but it hit one of those one of those charts right you know uh you know was there was a certain you know 18 godzillion uh streams that particular week right you know and you know it doesn't always happen but it's nice to see it happen because it's it's oh, sure. something that was created so long ago can still connect with young people who are streaming today, regardless yeah. of what the charts are. And there are so many different charts as well. But I suppose yeah. if it's doing well on any chart, it's still a hit. Yeah. yeah. To me. And I guess a song like that was just different enough that it, you know, struck a nerve with uh, with people who probably, you know, who, who never heard it. Well, I think it also speaks to how young people discover music now. Yes. You know, they're not following the charts. They're not listening to the radio. You know, they'll hear a song on a TV show or in a movie or in a commercial. Go, oh, what's that? And it'll and it'll, Mm -hmm. you know, it'll it'll grab their attention. I mean, look, I just got one of my favorite artists, uh, Juliette Comagere. I discovered her on an episode of Private Practice. Mm. There's a really Mm -hmm. intense scene i won't go it was it, it was like just a heartbreak it was like near the end of the episode and it was like just heartbreaking and there was no audio except for one of her songs called the big middle my wife and i are on the floor like sobbing i don't want to go into the story of the thing but it was like the way the story gets resolved it's like it's it's just devastating and we're like oh, what song is this this is good <laughs> and i took out like i think i know I didn't have Shazam at that time. No, I went on the pra- uh, private practice, had a website back then that would listed the music featured in this episode. Right. See, this mm. is what I'm talking about. This is like they yeah. know that, the, the, you know, 
in, they don't have soundtrack albums anymore, but there's a thing of like these, you know, the songs that got featured in today's episode. In today's episode, yeah. You know, um, and that says, so we're, we're, we're asking like what Beatles song would be a hit today. It's like, well, it would, thinking of how songs become hits today. Mm -hmm. what's going to cut through in that context. And I think come together, is, uh, come together is pretty, pretty hard to beat in terms mm -hmm. of like, it's got the songwriting, it's hooky and sonically there's enough interesting stuff going on mm -hmm. that, it, that, that it's it catches your ear. Okay. Well, these are great comments coming from the three of you and, uh, you know, someone who just, uh, really appreciates music from so many different decades and many different genres. I want to see all old music thrive again and be heard again. However people discover it is, is a good mm -hmm. thing. I wouldn't say that nobody listens to the radio anymore, John, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I certainly do. I discover a lot of uh, the newer rock. Right. Well, I mean, I'm just like I'm, I'm talking about like younger, younger people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, or at least they don't listen the same way anymore. Yes. You know, a lot of younger younger people, especially like teenagers, basically the only radio that they'll hear is if they're in the car and, you know, mom is playing the local, you know, Z100 type, mm -hmm. you know, CHR station. That's it. Otherwise, yeah. they, uh, you know, otherwise they're, they're hearing music from... Uh, you know, any number of different sources, but radio is not one of them. Well, there's so many other avenues now. I think all the yeah. besides all the streaming services, there's YouTube. Yep. Social media. Um, you know, the, I mean, I, I've asked some of like my younger relatives and cousins that I have like in my in their 20s, like, how do you like and they've got like pretty hip tastes they mm -hmm. they you know they're they follow a lot of you know new bands i'm like how do you like find out about stuff and it's like they they're communicating with each other they're just as enthusiastic about about music overall i think it just it's a different it serves a different purpose in their lives than it did like for us I for think. us you know you know well, it's not good or bad. It's just the way it is. Music was everything. Discovering all the new artists at that time. Sure, exactly. So, and I still try to do that, but it's not the same when you reach a certain age, you know, because other things become important. I'm not saying you won't ever like new music again, but it's always the music that you hear in your youth that has the greatest impact on you. Right. You know, like. You know, what's the saying, you know, that the, you know, uh, the music that you loved when you were 14, that's the music that you'll love for the rest of your life. And what year were you 14, Ken? 1973. 73, the greatest year ever <laughs> in the year, as far as the Beatles are concerned. Right. The greatest year in oh, Beatles. really? 73. Okay. So, Interesting. Yeah. All right. Hey, Red Rose Speedway. Ringo, Mind Games, Living in a Material World, Band on the Run, I Rest My Case, and the single for Live and Let Die. Yep. Yeah. Even Not Billy bad. Preston had a number one hit in 1973. Yeah. Who? Billy Preston. Right. Will it go around in circles? Yeah. So, you know, the stars were aligned just right in 1973, but so many more great albums was to follow beyond that. Mm. Anyway, mm. This has been great. And um, if anybody wants to get in contact with my guests, how can they do so? Well, anyone who listens to things we said today knows how to get in contact with, Dar with Darren, but you want to give out your uh, Yeah, for, for the sake of those who um, don't know, uh, you can um, uh, go to Facebook. I have two Facebook pages, uh, Darren DeVivo. The other one has got a little bit more of a heavy title heavy name, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcast or something to that effect. Like one or follow one, send me a friend request. Somehow we'll, we'll link up or email me at WFUV. Uh, my name spelled out Darren DeVivo 
D-A-R-R-E-N, D-E-V-I-V-O, at wfev dot org, and um, and you can tune in and listen uh, Monday through Thursday nights, ten p.m. till two a.m. Saturday afternoons, one to four, ninety point seven FM in uh, the tri-state area. Outside of that, or in the little pockets of the tri-state area where our signal loses to the uh, to the buildings, uh, wfev dot org or our app, which you can download. I guess you could get that in any wherever you get apps, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the app store, get the WFUV app. Okay, and of course you can catch Darren and myself and Alan Cozen on things we said today. Every two weeks there's a new episode. Got a lot of Revolver stuff coming very soon that we're looking forward to. John, how about you? Uh, JohnMontagna.com. That's pretty well, much. Well, that was short and sweet. That's easy to remember. <laughs> I'm I'm in grad school right now. I'm I'm in a master's program that is all consuming. So this was a welcome diversion from uh, my study. I'm I'm pretty much caught up for the week. I had okay. I had this evening free to to not be burying my face in a in a psychology book of some kind. Wow, <laughs> Need a little break from it all. <laughs> Yes, I appreciate the call. Thank you. Okay, and you know you're always welcome here. Anytime you have an idea for a show, just let me know. And Al, how about you? By the way, Al and Bruce Spicer will be on the channel next week as we celebrate Bruce's new book, The Beatles' Rubber Soul to Revolver, in which Al contributed a piece. He has been doing that in all of Bruce's- Two two pieces. Two pieces in uh, Bruce's books. And beyond that, you can always uh, find Al's work in Beetle Fan. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, and uh, make it, to make it short and sweet, just like John, uh, the easiest way to reach me probably is through, um, is through Facebook, you know, my pages, Al Sussman. And, um, and otherwise, I mean, you can reach me through Beetle Fan. Uh, www.beetlefan.com but uh, but facebook is probably the uh, the main the main contact mm-hmm. all right very good so thank you guys for being being here for this for this was fun brands. thanks for oh. asking inviting yeah <laughs> great, i hope this yeah. didn't uh great, great you know hurt your brains too much but uh <laughs> we had to think <laughs> Not much left to hurt, so. <laughs> These are all your typical questions that uh, you're asked, so that's why I enjoy doing a show like this. And maybe we'll do it again soon. Yeah, I'm going to go right. listen to the Let's Dance album. <laughs> yes. That's a good idea. <laughs> I'll go listen to Chic. There you go. All right. For Al and John and Darren, thanks so much for watching, and we will see you guys next time. Take care. <laughs>